safety. How may I help you? Um, yes, yeah, I'd like an officer at 829 Stony Brook. Um, her friend just woke me up. She's found her severed head of her son in the basement. Did she just wake up and say that? Yeah. Whose head is it? She's claiming it's her son. Has he been missing, or...? No, yeah, he was here yesterday with some chick, and then now all of a sudden nobody's here. 49-year-old Tara Pankinish looked into the basement of her home at 829 Stony Brook Lane, Green Bay, in the early morning of February 23, 2022. She could have never imagined the horrific scene she would stumble upon. Her only son, the kind and cheerful 24-year-old Shad Therian, had become a victim of a crime so horrifying it sent shockwaves throughout the city of Green Bay. In the annals of true crime, some cases stand out as particularly haunting, and this case is undoubtedly one of them. Our story today takes us to Green Bay, a city in the state of Wisconsin that is home to a stretch of the Fox River, an arm of Lake Michigan. With a population of over 100,000, Green Bay is a big bubbling city that is safer than 22% of U.S. neighborhoods. The city is also famous for historical attractions like the Heritage Hill State Historical Park, which contains about two dozen original and replica buildings from as far back as 1672. Lambeau Field, where the Green Bay Packers play their home games, and several museums and zoos are some of its other attractions. Green Bay has a relatively high crime rate compared to other cities in Wisconsin. Yearly, at least 5 out of 1,000 Green Bay residents are likely to be victims of violent crimes. But this never deterred locals like Tara Pankinich and her son, Shad Therian, from building their lives here. Shad Therian was born on September 7, 1997 in Green Bay, Wisconsin, to Tara Pankinich and Michael Therian. He was educated at the Howard Sumiko School District, where he attended the Bayport High School. While he was in high school, Shad met and fell for a pretty dark-haired girl named Taylor Shabiznis. For the next couple of years, Shad and Taylor were in an on-and-off relationship that only became more complicated and toxic as the lovebirds transitioned from puberty to adulthood. But despite Shad's tangled love life, he was a friendly, kind, and caring young man. After high school, he chose not to pursue a college degree, but rather decided to start working at his family's business with his father and grandfather. When he was not working, he enjoyed wood carving, camping, and spending time with his family. Shad had a great relationship with his parents, even though they were separated, and they, in turn, tried to be as available for him as they could be. Shad lived with his mother and her boyfriend at 829 Stony Brook Lane, Green Bay, Wisconsin, but he still found time to spend with his father. Little did they know that Shad was harboring dark secrets secrets that would ultimately lead to his tragic death. A little after 2.30 a.m. on February 23, 2022, Tara Pankinish, Shad's mother, suddenly bolted up from her sleep. She had heard a loud noise that sounded like a door being slammed shut. Next to her, her boyfriend, Steve Hendricks, was still sleeping soundly. Still groggy from sleep, trying to get her bearings, Tara heard the sound of a car pulling out of her driveway and driving off. She figured it must have been Shad's girlfriend going back to her apartment, so she did not think much of it. Tara decided to get out of bed and have a look around, just to make sure everything was okay. When she was satisfied that the doors were locked and everything was secure, she decided to go back to bed. Just then, she noticed a light on in the basement Shad had converted into a sort of apartment for himself. Tara glanced into the basement, but did not find anyone there, which was not unusual. Shad often spent the night at his girlfriend's place, so Tara decided just to go back to bed and call her son in the morning. But just as she was walking back upstairs, she noticed a black bucket with a towel draped over it. There was no reason why a bucket should have been there, and she wondered why it was covered with a towel. Out of curiosity, she bent down and moved the towel, and staring back at her was the most horrific sight she had ever seen in her entire life. Scrambling to get out of her basement as fast as her legs could carry her, Tara ran back upstairs. She rushed to her bedroom and woke Stephen up. Tara frantically tried to explain what she had just found in the basement, but she was not making any sense. Steve ran down to the basement to check it out by himself. 
and when he saw what Tara had seen, it took all his willpower for him not to become violently ill. Steve called 911 and tried to explain what he had seen to the dispatcher. Um, yes, I live in Officer 829 Stony Brook. Um, her friend just woke me up. She found her severed head of her son in the basement. Did she just wake up and say that? Yeah. Whose head is it? She's claiming it's her son. Has he been missing or? No, yeah, he was here yesterday with some chick and then now all of a sudden nobody's here. But Tara, still trembling, collected the phone and explained. She had just discovered her son's severed head in a bucket in her basement. Hello? Hi, Tara. So, can you tell me what's going on? Are you positive my son's head is in a bucket, a young bucket in my basement? What, may, what, what makes you think that? Because I looked in the bucket. When, what did you see? Exactly what I told you. Okay. Where, where's, the, uh, where's the rest of the body at? No idea. Okay. He was here a couple hours, then he left with Taylor. And then I heard my door and her minivan start. And I went downstairs and I went to the bathroom. The lights were out in the basement. And I went, heard them off and I looked around and I was there. And then when I turned around to come back upstairs, it was a side yellow bucket with a towel over it. All right, ma'am, I, I have officers that are, are, are headed over to your house right now. The first responders, two police officers from the Green Bay Police Department, arrived at the nondescript home at 829 Stony Brook Lane, Green Bay, Wisconsin, at around 3.25 a.m. They met Tara and Stephen and asked them again what the issue was. Quietly, Tara told them that she had found a severed head down in the basement. One of the responding officers asked if they had both seen it and they replied that they had. Did you both see this? I opened the towel, I picked up the towel, okay. and dropped it, because I don't know what the fuck it is, man. I had bad vision, and she's like, is that, is that what I think? Like, I don't fucking know okay. what okay. the fuck it is. Do you want to stay with those two? I'll just go and see it. Yeah, it's Where's it at? So right there? Yeah, there's a Look right, there's a bucket with a towel on it. Meanwhile, the officer's partner went downstairs into the basement. A quick look inside the bucket had him shouting for the other officer to come down and take a look. Once they saw the extremely grotesque scene in the basement, they knew they had to act fast in order to make sense of it. One of the officers continued looking around the basement for several minutes while calling for backup at least twice. He sounded urgent, saying, We've got quite a bit of blood down here. If we could get more units here sooner rather than later, that'd be appreciated. Um, we've got... Quite a bit of blood down here. When Green Bay Police Detective Philip Scanlon arrived at the scene, he knew that this was going to be one of the most gruesome murders he had to solve in his career. He also knew that this was not a random crime. It was a crime of passion committed by someone who most likely knew Shad intimately. It was the only reasonable assumption he could make from the absolute nightmare he was looking at. There was blood all over the floor of the basement and more on the mattress already forming a dark patch. There were several dog collar chains and adult toys scattered all over the floor, along with a black kitchen knife, a yellow pocket knife, a head of a shaving razor blade, and some nails. The whole scene looked like something out of a horror movie, and that was not even the worst of it. A medical unit had arrived on the scene by now, and their first task was to find the other parts of Shad's body. Deputy Medical Examiner Dr. Vincent Tranchita was on site to collect evidence and possible DNA samples. He and his team would discover three more containers with Shad's body parts, apart from the bucket Tara had initially discovered. Whoever had killed Shad had also dismembered him, placing his organs and body parts in a blue bag sitting on top of the dresser, a pink and gray bag on the floor, and a tote bag. They also discovered that the bucket Tara had initially discovered contained not only Shad's head, but also his male organs. But despite all these shocking discoveries, investigators were immediately faced with a major challenge. When they had collected the bags containing Shad's remains, Dr. Tranchita realized that the parts they had did not account for the full body. 
This meant his killer had likely taken some parts with them. But why would the killer leave the scene with the parts of their victim's body? It didn't make any sense. And without a body, investigators could not properly establish a timeline that led to the bloodbath they found in the basement of Tara's house. The investigation had barely even begun, but what they would soon learn would crack the case wide open. Investigators brought Tara and Stephen in for formal questioning and to get their statements. Killing a person and then dismembering their body was something that was very messy and would take hours to do. Although they had each other as alibis, it seemed suspicious that Tara and Stephen could have been in the house and not heard while someone killed and hacked Shad to pieces downstairs. So they still needed to be questioned. But while Tara was talking, she would mention something that, although she didn't think was important, would help investigators figure out who killed Shad. When Tara woke up suddenly after hearing a door slam in her house, she happened to glance out of the window and notice a vehicle pulling out of the driveway onto the street. The vehicle was a minivan belonging to Shad's girlfriend, Taylor Shabiznes. When the police heard this, they knew they had to question Taylor. In homicide cases, especially ones as violent as this, the victim's lover or spouse was usually the prime suspect. Also, Taylor was very likely the last person to see Shad alive, so some officers went to her apartment to speak with her. When police got to Taylor's apartment on Eastman Avenue, they found a minivan matching the description of the minivan Tara had described earlier. As they stood next to the minivan trying to peek inside, Taylor walked out of her apartment. She was wearing a black pair of sweatpants and a black sweatshirt and looked like she was just about to go run some errands. When she spotted the officers, Taylor froze. One of the officers would later describe her as being in shock when they asked her if she knew why they were there. Taylor said she knew why. Because of her recent conviction for fleeing, eluding, and obstructing a police officer, she had been sentenced to three months in jail on January 4th with work release privileges. It was unclear whether she was out of jail at the time on work release or not. Officer Tim Kenny, one of the officers who went to Taylor's apartment, noticed that Taylor had blood on her hands and stains that looked like blood stains on the front and back of her sweatshirt. She also had a cut on her left thumb and several scratches on her arm. He took photographs of all this as evidence. Although Taylor was only a suspect in the murder of her boyfriend Shad at this point, police arrested her and took her back to the station for a thorough interrogation. Taylor Denise Coronado, also known as Taylor Shabiznes, was born on November 23, 1997, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Taylor had a rough childhood. Her mother died when she was just a child, leaving her with a father who assaulted her throughout her childhood. As she grew up, Taylor learned to depend on drugs to cope with her mental health challenges. She also had several run-ins with police as a teenager, including fleeing and eluding and obstructing a police officer. As she got older, a childhood friend described her as a complete sex addict. Her most recent legal trouble was on January 4, 2022, when she was sentenced to three months in prison with work release privileges for removing a GPS tracker from her ankle. Taylor and Shad grew up together in Green Bay, but didn't become friends until they met at Bayport High School, which they attended together. They developed an on-and-off relationship that continued even after Taylor got married to Warren Shabiznes in 2017. Taylor and Shad continued to see each other even after Taylor had a child with her husband. Warren knew about his wife's relationship, as the couple allegedly had an open marriage. He was incarcerated at the time Shad got murdered so police ruled him out as a suspect early on. That left Taylor as the prime suspect, and now that she was in custody, police could begin questioning her. Surprisingly, it didn't take her long to confess that she was the one responsible for Shad Therian's tragic murder and dismemberment. So, the interrogation began at its own pace. Yeah, a fact. I hate the spot outfit. Never in my life. I'd rather be coping punk. The fundamental question at hand didn't revolve around whether Taylor committed the murder of Shad. The evidence uncovered by the police, coupled with her own confession, left no reason for doubt regarding her culpability. Instead, what was at stake were the potential consequences. If Taylor were to be declared not guilty in a court of law, 
on the grounds of insanity, the probable outcome would be her confinement to a mental institution rather than a conventional prison. In order to determine Taylor's mental state at the time of the crime, this interrogation held paramount importance, so the detectives initiated the process by formally reciting Taylor's Miranda rights. So if you don't ever say anything, it's be as, but you know, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. If the right to consult with a lawyer before questioning, to have a lawyer present with the during questioning, yet cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one would finally represent you at public expense before or during the questioning if you do wish. You may decide to answer questions now without a lawyer present, you better accept the questioning and remain silent any time you wish, including during a question. Do you have standing to be rights? Relate to the chat we write to you know them to answer questions or make a statement. Yes. Well, a few hours ago, Fletcher's dispatch to uh, address on Stoner Clark at um, the Pierre Sol's Shad theory. Do you know Shad? Uh, how do you English Shad? King of my hats. Do your hats? Wait, pardon? Well, they found a hat of the stirring meat stuff that that pulse there. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of it. Um, Basically, Stats head. Yeah, the beer fuck coat. Mm. And then, so we know you were there at one point. Yeah. With Stat. Um, we also know you left. Now, that man, is that their van? See, I'm on the swine neighbors. Your name? Old Fleals Stan. Oh, so this, where did you go with Riper to his kitchen without easement? Mm -hmm. Cut is that where you live? Yeah. I'll fall. That's the thing Okay, is that in the apartment? No. You know. Whose part is it? Nappy. Or who is that? Sat? Fonts. So, you need that as his bed? Yes. Up there. And so, did you leave from Shad's house and go to Scott's house? Sometime today. Yeah. Well, they found part of Shad at his home with his mom's house. Fell his head. Where's the rest of this body? It's there inside the house. It is in the house. Can you tell me what happened? It's a good question because I blacked out during that time. At this point, Taylor claimed that she experienced a blackout during the incident, a claim that can be perceived as a potential evasive tactic, to sidestep providing intricate details. It's not uncommon for suspects to employ such strategies during questioning, as fabricating a believable story on the spot can be exceedingly challenging. By alleging a blackout, Individuals may also attempt to mitigate their responsibility for the crime. However, there are instances where individuals genuinely commit offenses without being fully conscious of their actions, such as in cases involving altered mental states. The question that loomed was whether Taylor's case fell into that category, or she was merely feigning it as a defense. To uncover the truth, we must proceed with the video and delve deeper into the interrogation. I ain't trying to. Okay. No problem. Take the thumb that was more other. Yes. So you think the hot needs up there? Let's we'll see why not. Unless just up and down. That she could. You know. Where is your mind? Deep. I'll trade that right with that. Right, but he. Yeah, it's been awful. Like an upcoming man by the bank, you're calling bodies in an altar. 
Well, there's a stewardship on Gates now. Yeah. Does anybody else tell me what kind? What do you think? He you know, likes a chef. Yes. All of that, I. He loves a little talk. That you see it at all the time? Yeah. Okay. But, um, you sort of remember not what happened with Shep? Yeah. Well, that book will remember some talk. Oh, um, you Oh, oh, well, there's a song that's this king that is Miss King when I and that on the yeah, like I was playing around for me and we were we were still in the mix, right? Like, I um, I'm zero a lot of explaining things, so I have up, but fair, and then. Here comes the chain, right? And he put it around his neck while we were like playing around your shit. And then, um, he was bleeding. The fact that Taylor admitted to strangling Shad during an intimate moment as a part of foreplay is undeniably unsettling. What was even more disturbing, however, was her casual and nonchalant demeanor while recalling the gruesome details of the act and her laughter only serves to emphasize her complete lack of remorse for her actions. In situations as emotionally charged as this, maintaining composure can be an arduous task, yet the detective handled the situation with remarkable professionalism. You say you're solving the bitch, but with that... I... I... Please? I... But... Um... Have you taken any other drugs tonight? No, I'm just stopping today. I don't mind fucking night. Are you smoking? No, it's... In how? On a pipe or someplace else? No the one that's on the counter or on the table. And I, I left the van either. Did I did it. Where? I mean, I mean, should be... But where exactly be some in or split? I thought I should. That's shit. And you say, where was this place? Where would it be? In the basement or first floor or second floor? Basement. Okay. And it was ice in a, you know, it was a bath. Typically, it didn't go bad. Type of little small type. Get bad in the fractional. But, uh, Taylor's admission that both she and Shad had consumed drugs at the time of her event was a critical aspect of this case. It introduced the crucial question of whether these substances played a role in shaping her state of mind and influencing her decision-making during the incident. Understanding the complete context surrounding the event, including the role of drugs, was essential to unravel the motivations behind it. With Taylor voluntarily divulging information, he tactfully delved deeper into the events, seeking to uncover the reasons behind what transpired. They had, um, they just you would get. And so there was a chain. <clears throat> you know, cutting chain? Go on an um, insane place and we're in a bitch. Movies on a stock And what would that be again? I think it's on my dresser. On a dresser? Is it, you know, on my one? Is it on your dresser? I'm... I don't know either. I haven't been there. I mean, it's best as you can remember. So you think that there could be a chain and the ice on the dresser down in the basement. This was weird. I got like a weird flash then. I mean, don't. But what happened? Yeah, this short. It was so short. What did you see? I didn't know any now that I got it was got uh, like weird. I was writing them like in Donkey, okay? And then like uh, I think so. I think that's what was happening. I was what are falling and like I don't know. Were um you two being intimate at his sights? Both getting there. Just getting okay. So will this be considered foreplay? And 
and the lust, and then um, I have mom, and then um, I just didn't stop. I don't know why, and then stop. We guys done something like this in the past. Think oh. that. Do you use manual strangulation during sets at all? The shed like that. A uh, um, manual strangulation? Yes, 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 yes. He likes strangulation. You like? So I don't know. See now that's. Yeah, yeah. Do you be too or is? All of us. So what would you? So when's the last time you guys had sex besides potentially soaring? You may leave me, but like me and kids, like um, I'm sorry, and they'll be in. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't. All right, but when's the last time you did? I mean, I played with something only at first. Hold on. August. And what would you guys like to do? Is there a certain role playing that you did with Chad or was it just some sort of translation? How would you guys um, clear and basically have sex? Keep calm. My ID is high on me too. So, in the Tiat and me on a call. No, the what? But this is a funny, like, strangle the other person. I like them no. All right, so you like being strangled, like having it, your, your hair away, or do you like doing it to somebody else? I can't, somebody else. The shadow, like, the strangle, turn sets. I have you died before. Yeah. The depth, you know, the ski likes it. That you use what we call props in the past. Yes. What? On the dildo. Dad or rope or chain or underwear or rape. But lady. Yeah. That I I, I shoved the dildo in the ass and mouth. Then past or just recently. When you was there, off when you was on the bed. Yeah. While Taylor claimed that Shad approved and enjoyed the strangulation during their intimate moments, there remains a significant degree of uncertainty. She could very well be fabricating this story. What was undeniably certain, however, was that Shad would not have enjoyed it as he was dying and likely tried to stop her. Unfortunately, that didn't stop her. In fact, Taylor's open admission that she derived pleasure from using different props made it all the more troubling. This was far from what most people would consider normal in a relationship. According to Taylor, she picked up Shad from his mother's house at around 9.30 p.m. on February 21, 2022. Alexander Gannon, also known as AJ, one of their mutual friends, later joined them, and the three of them went to an apartment on Eastman Avenue to smoke cannabis. They smoked methamphetamine and shot themselves up with trazodone. When they left the apartment, Shad and Taylor drove back to Tara's house. So you and Shad went back to uh, Shad's mom's house. Did how'd you get it? Did you see was there anybody home? What time do you think this was? Did was anybody home? Did you you told her anybody? I just gave his mom with Tara. 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 Uh, that's a mom to me. Yes. Taking head. Yeah, I Taylor further said that night they spent their intimate moments in the basement and in no time engaged in their unconventional explicit activities as they frequently did. And that's when Shad brought out two sets of chains, one for him and one for Taylor. These chains, as she revealed, would ultimately become the murder weapon. In response, the detectives prompted Taylor to provide a detailed description of these chains. And can you just fire them to? Chain. Chain of Lenin. Chain of Lenin. And what side? Were the dog chains or a large clock type of chain? You know, I can just play. 
Wood. So silver chains. And you have two. And what you guys do with them? It's on the right hand. You did. And what were you doing while they were on the X? I was standing on keep straddling. I just went, oh. Was their clothes on there or off? It was striking to observe Taylor's complete absence of regret or remorse as she calmly recounted even the most minute details of the case. Without a trace of hesitation, she described the chilling scene where Shad was positioned face down on the bed during their intimate encounter. Taylor confessed to getting on top of him and tightly pulling around his neck. It became apparent that she must have recognized the dire consequences of her actions as Shad's life hung in the balance. So the detective took a direct approach, questioning her about the precise moment when the realization that Shad might be dead dawned upon her. So why did you realize that Shad was not alive anymore? He knocked his face down the boat full. So he's cocking him flooding. He was pissing himself. This case was about purple. I still don't stop the animal. So he's not. That's the body name, right? So his blood was going out of his mouth. Yeah, it Yeah, it's hard to eat. I'm sorry? Here in Crope. Her admission that she found the act strangely appealing and chose to continue offered a disturbing glimpse into Taylor's psyche indicating a notable lack of self-control and empathy. But could she have at any point recognized the gravity of the situation and considered seeking help? Even if only briefly, Taylor's forthcoming response will provide clarity on this matter. The use of chains, along with Taylor's apparent reluctance to seek help upon realizing Shad was dead, could potentially suggest premeditation. However, the state in which Shad's body was found indicates an element of impulsiveness. This is compounded by Taylor's nonchalant demeanor throughout the entire ordeal, which would be unusual for someone who had meticulously planned a murder, as they likely would have prepared a defense strategy as well. The critical question that remained was at what point Taylor made the decision. Given that only the head was discovered inside the bucket, the detective initiated his inquiries from that point. How did you dismember its body? Nice. What? Nice, 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 nice. Nice. Did it water the wine night? Where did you get those from? Kitchen. So I find mine and the other was a judge and. Do you want a shirt? No, no. That was all right. Redneck. Particularly with the head on the body? Or did you do the blood wrapping all the body? It's, it's still a knife, still a needle. I mean, with the, uh, like, the snail, the deal. There's a shower in the basement. People only had to say, well, look at me. I just come to die. I've been wondering that I was so learned. What did you do? And a little bit of a minute. The bucket? Yeah. Oh, well, I drained the head. Part of it, I blow it away. After a club of things, I was going to go in the sausage, but when you hear blood in this bucket, you could tell me how the head should have took the brains and on by the others. And now I. So you cleaned the set and the shower and the, the, the bucket. Yeah, I'm just. Call it set off that on. Call it. I like, I like. And what do you use to stumble at that thumb without having. The Niles. The Niles. Where they? Oh, you said under the fire, right? What kind of nights were they? They might so about it. But your diet? Hey, at the kitchen, the iron's always had me. How many picked your block? There was two, she bought them. There was two, like, little high of it. And then um, there were, like, for all the warnishes. And yeah, and on the other one, there were probably nice sticks. Six inch mass. You were really want you to stay kind of on the bread and knife. And you say bread and knife, did that hike the serrated itch on that or was it a bread? 
you know, I need my serrate. Um, and where were these knives, say, a kitchen? There and... Oh, the... They were in us around it. But again, uh, like a nice folder thing, art explorer, or where? They know lang. They can all and talking to the angels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, some a boulder. It, uh, that that's the one right there. Like it was in long. By the body thing. By the uh, It was clear from Taylor's confession that she dismembered Shad's body within hours after his murder. She placed the head inside a bucket, where it was later found, and placed other body parts in plastic bags. While all this was going on, Tara, Shad's mother, and her boyfriend Steve were away. Taylor seized the opportunity and stayed in the house with Shad's corpse throughout the following day, February 22, 2022, even after Tara and Steve returned home. In the early morning of February 23rd, she drove her minivan back to her apartment. Detectives believe that, when Tara and Steven returned from their trip, she did not check the basement for Shad, so they did not actually see him, Taylor, or anyone else who might have been there at the time. During their inspection at the crime scene, the police only found Shad's severed head along with some body parts. So after Taylor's arrest, they had gotten a search warrant for Taylor's car and apartment and were trying to find clues as to what happened to Shad, particularly anything that could explain why Shad's body parts were missing and where those missing body parts were. They stumbled upon the remaining body parts in a crockpot box in Taylor's minivan. However, during the interrogation, when detectives informed her about this, she made a disturbing comment. What did I have plant candles for on the word and from pianists? They're all dismembered. Pop hat. Yeah. Murdering and dismembering Shad was one thing, but it still didn't explain why Taylor had decided to carry some of the dismembered parts with her and leave others in the basement. When questioned about this, her response was bizarre. And then um, I know I forgot the head. I forgot the head. But you were here, I think, living? Yeah. I think the man. What? I think the man. Get bone. It says, what is it? What is it? Yeah. Um, but name. The what? I think it's a butt. A play? Yeah, the thing. Honestly, I just, I'm like, I don't know where you're all in that, like, man, it's messy, something like that. I got lazy. Okay. I got lazy, and that's what I did, so I'm like. Okay. Despite the signs in her demeanor hinting at an underlying sadistic behavior, the detective made a bold choice to confront Taylor directly. He asked her outright whether she truly desired the death of her lover or not. Sometimes, these direct and clear-cut questions have the potential to expose hidden truths in suspects that they might otherwise never admit to. Right, you're going to bring with you when you thought, uh, but were the bags there when you use them? Or they could bring that what you was shat. Bridge just fine there. I think the in there, I pound in there, and I um, emptied them out and threw them in there, and I hold them bring, and I'm just, I got nearly, and, and I have eight, and I never get kind of at this time. This time was just like, I think it was a dope. I think luck and dope. So, did you want shit to be dead? No, no, it was out of random. Like, I wasn't expecting that, and it kind of threw me off guard. And it was an open place and all that. You went into big time. Though Taylor's responses seemed to indicate that she was under the influence of substances, this raised one more question of how the drugs might have impacted her psychological profile. Nevertheless, regardless of the contributing factors, by the conclusion of the interrogation, the detectives had gathered enough evidence to move on the next step. Now that the medical examiners had all of Shad's body parts, they could piece together the clues and figure out how Shad died. Deputy Medical Examiner Dr. Tranchita was able to establish the cause of death as strangulation, which matched Taylor's account of events. He noted that Shad's face was purple in spite of being severed from the rest of his body. There were hemorrhages or burst blood vessels in his face, mouth, and neck. There were signs on his tongue, which included abrasions and indentation. All these signs were consistent with strangulation and significant force being applied to the neck. Meanwhile, 
Evidence collected from the scene was sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab for DNA testing. Kevin Scott from the crime lab was assigned to the case, and he started testing all the evidence brought in for DNA samples. Scott found out that the blood found at the scene met Shad's DNA. In one of the samples sent to the lab, Scott found DNA from more than one person, but he didn't have enough material to reach a conclusion about who the DNA belonged to. Police also found a glass pipe in a bag with a light-colored powder inside it, verifying Taylor's statement that she and Shad had been using substances. With all the evidence they had found so far, police had enough grounds to arrest Taylor on charges, including first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and third-degree assault of Shad Therian. Since she had a history of trying to evade arrest or avoid her sentences, she was deemed a flight risk, and bail was placed at $2 million. She was held at the Brown County Jail in Wisconsin. On September 1, 2022, Taylor's attorney Quinn Jolly submitted a not guilty by reason of insanity plea. On February 14, 2023, Jolly requested the trial date be pushed back so experts could determine Taylor's competency to stand trial. This seemed to anger Taylor, leading to a courtroom outburst that culminated in her attacking her own attorney. In the aftermath of this shocking incident, Jolly was forced to file a motion to be removed from the case. After the motion was granted, Christopher Froelich took over the case on March 3rd, and the first thing he did was file a motion for Judge Thomas J. Walsh to step down from the case. The attorney claimed that since the judge had witnessed Taylor attacking her previous attorney, he would not be objective, but Judge Walsh refused to step down. On July 21st, court ordered psychologist Dr. Matthew Seipel testified that Taylor was competent to stand trial, and Judge Walsh upheld that testimony in his judgment. The trial began on July 24, 2023, at the Brown County Courthouse. Taylor did not appear remorseful during the trial. At some point, she made finger gun gestures while sitting in court. The defense tried to prove that Taylor suffered from bipolar disorder from adolescence, which made it impossible for her to appreciate the wrongfulness of her actions and also deprived her of volitional control. But two court-appointed psychologists who testified for the prosecution stated that Taylor's actions were influenced by the drugs she had consumed prior, which made her ineligible for the insanity plea under Wisconsin's definition of mental disease. They also stated that Taylor's decision to dismember the body and then attempt to clean the basement was proof that she understood the wrongfulness of her actions, not to mention the fact that she had deliberately put a bucket at the edge of the bed and moved Shad's body in such a way that all the blood would spill into the bucket and not on the floor. The defense argued that Shad could have died from drug overdose, given the drugs found in his body via blood test. But that argument was countered by Deputy Medical Examiner Dr. Trinchita's testimony that the hemorrhaging in Chad's face had happened before he died. The defense also tried to get the charge of third-degree assault dropped on the basis of the fact that since Chad was already dead, it would have been impossible for Taylor to assault him, but that motion did not stand as well. Throughout the trial, Taylor's husband, Warren, showed support for her, blaming her actions on mental health issues, addiction, and postpartum depression. As the prosecution and defense argued their cases, the jury saw graphic photos and videos of items the police found in Tara's basement and Taylor's car. These included pictures of Shad's body parts in different containers, adult toys, dog collars, chains, and bloody knives. Part of the evidence the prosecution provided was Taylor's search history obtained from her mobile phone, where there were searches related to serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. On July 26, 2023, the 12-person jury debated for less than an hour before returning with a verdict. They found Taylor Shabiznes guilty on all charges, including first-degree intentional homicide, mutilation of a corpse, and third-degree assault. Due to the seriousness of her crimes, Taylor faced a life sentence because the death penalty had been abolished in Wisconsin. On September 26, 2023, Taylor was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, ending the saga once and for all. Assistant District Attorney Caleb Saunders would note Taylor's guilt in a statement, where he said Taylor made a series of choices that led to the death of her boyfriend from high school, Shad Therian, 
For Taylor, it was not enough to execute her twisted fantasies on the unsuspecting Shad. She had to do so in the most gruesome manner possible, without feeling any bit of remorse after the fact. Shad Therian's life was cut short by someone he loved, or at the very least, felt safe around. And while his family mourns the loss, they can look forward to the future as their son's murderer got the maximum punishment for her crimes. Perhaps now, they can begin to heal and remember Shad for the kind and loving person that he was. Would you say justice had been served in this case, or do you think Taylor's insanity plea should have stood, giving her history of drug abuse and mental illness? Leave us a comment explaining what you think. We'd love to hear your thoughts. If there is a case you'd like us to cover, do not hesitate to share your suggestion in the comments section below. For more captivating true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.